Good morning and welcome. My name is Bridget Fletcher. I'm the Managing Director for Graduate Student Programs and Services at the Pratt School of Engineering. I'm excited to be a part of this celebration honoring the graduates from our engineering master's programs. At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Vinick Dean of Engineering who will provide our welcome remarks, Jerome P. Lynch. Good morning to you all and a happy Mother's Day weekend to all the mothers and motherly figures that are in the audience with us today. As Bridget mentioned, I'm Jerry Lynch. I'm the Vinick Dean of Engineering here at Duke University, and it is a true honor for me to celebrate this amazing career milestone with all of our graduates this morning. This morning, you are graduating from Duke University, ready to fearlessly take on the world. My colleagues and I have watched with awe and inspiration as this class has grown in our classrooms and our laboratories how you've overcome challenges and persevered during difficult moments, and how you have bonded at a singular community drawing strength from one another. As we send you out to the world to live your dreams and to tackle the big problems worth solving, we could not be more proud of all of you. Of course, none of us make this journey alone. Let us take a moment to recognize the important cast of supporters who have helped each of you every step of the way. So I'd like to ask all the family and friends of our graduates to please stand for a moment. Graduates, let's give them a great round of applause. Thank you. In case you haven't noticed, there's a handful of signs and banners hanging all throughout our campus this entire year because we are celebrating our 100th birthday as Duke University. As graduates of the class of 2024, you all share a special place in the annals of the history of this great institution as the 100th class to graduate of Duke. Hence, given our centennial, it's only fitting that my brief remarks today center on the Duke family. Not because they were the namesake of our university, but rather for the lessons that they can teach us. The stories of the Dukes of Durham is a true American tale, a Horatio Alger tale of self-made American family that rose from very humble origins in Orange County, North Carolina, to be one of the wealthiest families in all of America by the turn of the 20th century. While there are a plethora of lessons that we can learn from the Dukes, there are a few I'd like to share with you that are at the very core of our identity as the Duke community. While the story of the Duke family making their fortune in tobacco is well known, what is perhaps less known is how vital their embrace of technology and entrepreneurship was to their success. At a time when tobacco was sold as loose leaf for pipes, James Buchanan Duke, also known as Buck, saw the opportunity to bring the convenience of cigarettes to consumers. The only issue was the high cost associated with manually rolling cigarettes in a factory. In 1885, the Duke secured two machines from James Bonesack that could automate the rolling of cigarettes with one machine producing at a rate of equivalent to 50 hand rollers in a factory. While this adroit adoption of technology in the form of automation was game changing, what ensured it drove Duke's success was the use of their patents and securing exclusive rights from the Bonesack Machine Company to ensure that they remained ahead of their competitors. The Duke's dominance of the tobacco industry through innovation and entrepreneurship is one of the earliest examples of the playbook that we still use today for technology-driven enterprises. What is the lesson in all of this? Do not just be great engineers when you leave our campus. Rather, be great engineers whose entrepreneurial mindset unleashes the creative powers that you all possess. Build the business acumen needed to convert your creative efforts into viable solutions that have real impact for people. In the Pratt School of Engineering, we use the phrase in service to society to define our unwavering belief in training the next generation of engineers who are socially minded to take on the big challenges that lead to a better society. We can trace this commitment to the Duke family. 
After achieving commercial success in tobacco, the Duke sought to drive greater economic opportunity for the population of North Carolina by investing in much needed energy infrastructure for a growing state manufacturing sector. James Buchanan Duke and his brother Benjamin led a massive initiative to construct dams and reservoirs on the Catawbob River in North Carolina's Piedmont region. In fact, Lake James, north of Charlotte, is named after James Buchanan Duke for this monumental achievement. The Duke's dream of electrifying the region through hydropower was a bold idea poised for massive impact. The Duke brothers were fearless in pursuing them because they believed that their ideas would transform the state for the better. And indeed it did. The growth of the state, including the very existence of Charlotte as a major American city, is due in large part to the Duke's gift of regional energy. The lesson to be learned is that Dukies should never shy away from tackling problems of their day. In fact, tackle them vigorously with the big and bold ideas that they demand. Be fearless in deploying them at scales. Others would lack the courage to even try. If you do, we promise you that you will leave the world at a better place than you all found it. Nearly 100 years ago, when James Buchanan Duke endowed Trinity College, he intentionally changed the name of Trinity to Duke University as a memorial to his father, Washington Duke. This act of familial love not only established the great university that we all call home, but in naming our university Duke, it expanded the very definition of the Duke family to ensure that it encompasses all of us. Hence, our strength and greatness as a school is our sense of belonging to this greater Duke family. Family means working with shared purpose and supporting one another every step of the way. Especially as you tackle the truly grand challenges that lie ahead, you're going to need each other. And as you strike success, invest in the next generation of the Duke family by giving generously back as the Duke family invested in all of us 100 years ago. I know each of you is capable of achieving incredible success in any endeavor that you may pursue. It reminds me of the lyrics that many of you Swifties will get. What's a girl gonna do? A diamond's gotta shine. Oh yes, and I've seen your shine, and it is what gives me and my colleagues great hope. As we tackle global problems like climate change, poverty, and global security, I know it will be the Dukies at the vanguard of solving these seemingly intractable problems. No matter what lies ahead, though, just remember that you are forever members of the Duke family. But being in this family carries responsibilities. Return the support that you've so generously received when called on. Remember the social good when fulfilling your ambitions as a great technologist or entrepreneur and always give back to your communities whenever and wherever possible. Because at the end of the day, that's what your new degree is founded on, innovation, entrepreneurship, philanthropy, and family. It's no mistake that both the lake and the university created by James Buchanan Duke bears the name of the great family, the Dukes. It's emblematic of the love shared between an incredible family, a love and family that I am honored and privileged to welcome you all to as graduates of the 100th class of Duke University. Congratulations to the class of 2024. Thank you, Dean Lynch. We'll now have an opportunity to hear from our student speaker. And I learned right before the ceremony that they did not share with their family that there's the student speakers. We're about to deliver a pretty awesome Mother's Day gift. I would like to welcome Archit Kyla to the stage. <laughs> Archit is a December 2023 graduate who earned a Master of Engineering in Artificial Intelligence. Welcome, Archit. Thank you, Bridget, for the warm welcome. Uh, good morning, namaste, and welcome, everyone. I am humbled to be here today to celebrate our accomplishments and to congratulate all the graduates from the many diverse engineering master's programs. To all the incredible parents, family members, mentors, teachers, friends, mentors, loved ones here today who have supported my fellow students in their pursuit of educational enrichment. Let me say to you all, welcome to Duke.
before I go any further, let's give a round of applause to all the amazing moms here on Mother's Day weekend. After consulting with ChatGPT, I'm ready to distill an integrative schema of encapsulating the multifactorial insights garnered during my tenure at Duke. Or, as my friends would say, share what I've learned as my journey as a Blue Devil. I promise I made sure this morning to remove all the random facts about penguins and how to build a spaceship in your backyard, added by my buddy friend ChatGPT secretly into the middle of my speech. Okay, no more AI jokes for now. Uh, hello, class of 2023 and 2024. I'm Archit. I've had the honor of serving on the Student Advisory Board, guiding peers as a teacher, teaching assistant for multiple courses, and playing a key role in organizing Duke's first ever Generative AI Hackathon. Alongside learning from brilliant minds, I've celebrated every Duke versus UNC win, been to shooters, and enjoyed free pizza at every Duke event. As we all step forward today, I carry with me not just a master's of engineering in AI, but a heart full of Blue Devil spirit. Before I move forward, I need to apologize to my parents sitting right here in front of me because I didn't tell them I was going to be one of the speakers. I will never be able to find the right words to thank my mom, dad, my sister, my family, and my girlfriend for all the sacrifices they made every day so I could proudly stand here and no words would ever be enough. 628 days ago. Anyone knows what that is? Well, we all stepped onto this very campus, imagining this day our graduation would come up one day. But before we walk the stage, let me take you through a Blue Devil's journey of stories and lessons learned. Let's teleport back to an extraordinary classroom experience. So picture this. We are a group of 15 students from the AI program in Professor John Riff Schneider's machine learning class and we are supposed to build multiple critical projects across the semester. Now John, sorry to put the spotlight on you, is, an ordinary, is not your ordinary professor. He loves infusing adventure into our learning, and I'm pretty sure you all would have had a professor like him. Imagine the anticipation and anxiety we all faced uh, when we all faced John's unique method for our project selection. The role of a big dice. Yes, you heard me right. A big dice as big as the palm of my hand would roll and give you your project theme. So it was fate that determined uh, what my project is going to be in what theme in that uh, for every project. So just like the magical sorting hat in Harry Potter decides your house, John's magical dice, when rolled, gives you the theme of your project. But here's the twist. John is good. He gave us a superpower and that is to re-roll re -roll the dice just once if you're not satisfied with the original theme. But fate has a sense of humor, at least for me, despite my covert attempts to sway destiny with multiple secret roles without telling John, I always ended up with the same, same project theme. I was consistently paired with the same challenging topic. Uh, so whenever this dice came out of his pocket, it instilled a, uh, it instilled a mixed feelings of fear and excitement. But yet, this quirky method of choosing our projects led to a path that is unexpected. The project theme I dreaded became an incredible opportunity for innovation and collaboration. Together with my team, we not only embraced the challenge, but excelled at creating a project that earned accolades and opened new doors for me. Landing me an opportunity to build my career at a prestigious pharma company. The experience taught me a valuable lesson that I carry very close to my heart. Life is much like John's dice. It is unpredictable and full of surprises. It's not about the number we roll, but how we choose to navigate the path it unveils. Embrace the unknown with enthusiasm and resilience, for even the most daunting challenges can lead to unexpected triumphs and opportunities. Stay persistent, stay hopeful, and who knows, your unexpected moment might just be around the corner. Hamesha date raho is one of the most important beliefs I've learned from my father. It means always persevere. No matter the obstacles or challenges, keep pushing forward, for it is through persistence that we achieve our greatest victories. And like my mother says, never be ashamed of trying. Success does not come without trying. 
When I think about what I'll miss besides the breathtaking views from the top of the Duke Chapel and the claustrophobic 239 steps it takes to get there, it is all the friends and family that I've made here at Duke. Professors have turned into friends, friends have turned into family, and it is these bonds that have made Duke so special for me. I carry with me a simple yet profound hope to make a difference with AI. I see it not as a tool to replace, but to empower, to help us all do our jobs better and uncover opportunities we are yet to discover. We must ensure AI is used responsibly, enhancing our work and enriching our lives. I want to make this world a better place, and as we all move forward in our lives, I encourage each and every one of us to pursue our dreams and keep pushing. Believe in yourself, and like Ted Lasso taught us, be curious, not judgmental. As we all step into the next chapter of our lives, don't forget, East or West, Duke Blue is the best. Thank you. Thank you, Archit, for sharing your message with us today. I'm pleased to share that we have a special guest here today. Sheeran Biswas is here to deliver the commencement message. Sheeran is a 2015 graduate from Duke University where he earned a Master in Engineering Management degree. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he works as a mechanical design engineer, managing the custom skid design and fabrication projects for Caratech Incorporated. He also leads their proprietary product line of seal pots. Outside of, en of the engineering world, Sheeran volunteers with a global network of nonprofit organizations called Mankind Projects, where his work is focused on creating a community where people practice self-care. Using his background in engineering and human-centered design, he has also created several self-help self tools that teach people how to cope with stress, regulate emotions, manage conflict, and build self-care routines. In his free time, Sheeran can be found painting, riding his motorcycle, and practicing martial arts. Please join me in welcoming Sheeran. Thank you, Bridget. Graduates. Jodi tor dak shone kyo na ashe, tobe akla cholore. This is a Bengali verse written by Nobel Prize winner Rabindranath Tagore. Don't worry, the rest of the speech is going to be in English. This verse translates to, even if no one answers your call for help, you must still continue walking your path by yourself. This is a choice that I have made throughout my life, consciously or subconsciously, even when I was too young to understand it. When I was seven, I loved playing with toy trains. I had this green battery-operated toy train that I was specially attached to. I would spend hours and hours playing with this thing. One day, the train stopped working. I changed the batteries, but it didn't work. So I smacked it a couple times, just like I had seen my parents smack the TV remote when it wasn't working. That didn't work either. When I asked for help, my parents said they would buy me a new one for my birthday. Mm-mm, unacceptable. I wanted my toy train to work, the one that I was attached to, not a new one. I had a caretaker at the time. So I asked him to take me to an appliance repair shop. You know the places that fix refrigerators and televisions? The electrician there told me, toys like these break often and cannot be fixed. Now I had given up. See, if an electrician, whose sole purpose is to know how to fix things, cannot fix my toy train, then surely all hope is lost. I remember feeling so sad for several days after that. I did not know this at the time, but the grief was not about my toy train. It was about feeling let down by people who I thought were smarter than me, people who could help me. I did not like this feeling of helplessness. Not long after that, I remember something. When I was at the repair shop, I had seen that all the appliances were disassembled. And I thought, huh, so to fix something, you must open it up. Well, that makes sense, because I'd seen doctors do the same thing to fix people on TV. So I grabbed some tools from Dad's cabinet, and I opened up my toy train, and I looked inside. Of course, none of what was inside made any sense to me. I was seven. So then I thought, if I open another toy that's working fine, then I can compare the two together and figure out what's missing in my train, and I can get it to work again. You know where this is going. I had opened up all of my toys. I was on a mission. 
And by the time I was finished, not only did I fix my train, but I had taken parts from all the other toys and attached it to my train. So my train moved forward, backwards, and it had blinking lights all over it, just like a disco ball. I had a unique toy that no other kid on this planet had, and I had made that happen for myself. I felt so proud, so happy. I had faced what felt like the biggest challenge of my life so far. I had asked for help, but it wasn't answered the way I wanted. But I continued to walk my path anyway, and it worked out better than I could have hoped for. There's something amazingly powerful about the perseverance and tenacity of a young child. We all have this superpower inside us, but it gets tainted, worn out, even lost by the time we become adults. Today, I'm going to teach you how to reconnect with that inner superhero. Graduates, stand up for me, please, if you can. Now keep your feet shoulder width apart, take your hands and turn them into fists, and place them on your hips. Puff out your chest, take some space, tilt your chin up a little. Now close your eyes and think of a time in your childhood when you felt proud of yourself. Think of the earliest memory you can think of. Remember, this has to be a time where you felt proud of yourself. Not your parents, not your teachers, but you. In this memory, you must have felt so strong, so powerful, invincible, or happy. Whatever the feeling was, allow yourself to feel that feeling now. Now take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Now open your eyes and take your seats. When no one answers your call, it's really hard to pull yourself back up on your own. But you can do it if you can pull every last ounce of strength you have left in you. Next time you find yourself in a challenge, feeling lost, distraught, tired, do this exercise. Tap into this memory that you thought of right now and remind yourself what you're made of. This exercise has helped me several times throughout my life. In 2018, I faced another challenge. At the time, I was working for a startup called LP Amina. We built emission control power plants for gas and coal-fired power. Oh, sorry, I fumbled. <laughs> There's another thing. It's OK if you fumble in the life out there. It works out fine. At the time, I was working for a startup called LP Amina. We built emission control systems for coal and gas-fired power plants. It was a lean company, but it was run by some of the smartest people I know. The emission control market was not having a great year at the time, so we were all working on different strategies to keep the company alive. One Friday, our CEO announced that we had run out of funding. We were going to close the doors permanently, and at the close of business, all of our jobs would be terminated. I was heartbroken. But I didn't have time to grieve the loss of people I was working with or the projects that I was working on. You see, I was an immigrant here on a work visa which meant that the moment my employment was terminated, I had 60 days to find a job. It had to be in the same industry, it had to be relevant to my master's degree, and it had to be similar to my old job. If I couldn't, I would have to leave the US. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Many of you may have gone through this yourself, or some of you may even know somebody else who is going through this right now. Leaving the US to go back to your home, back to your family and friends, that doesn't sound so bad, does it? Until you think of all the hardships a person from other side of the planet must have gone through to get in the US in the first place. Battling through academic competitions, getting accepted at a prestigious university with a low acceptance rate, struggling through financial challenges, and jumping through a maze of immigration laws and processes. All of that hard work would come undone. Mm-mm, unacceptable. I spent the next 60 days reaching out to my network, sending out resumes and cover letters. I drove hours and hours across cities, networking with prospective employers. I would reach out to them and say, hey, I'm in your neighborhood this week. Let's catch up for coffee. I don't even like drinking coffee. 
but I send that to everyone across the US. I was in everyone's neighborhood available for a quick chat. I had called for help and I had started walking my path. I had 60 days to get to my destination. On day 42, it was another Friday, I got my first offer letter. It felt like this was the first time that I had taken a full breath since my termination. The salary and benefits were what I wanted. The company was aware of my visa situation and they were willing to sponsor me and they wanted me to stop, start as soon as possible. They still had to get the visa paperwork going, but I was going to be able to start my job before my 60 days were up. I felt so relieved. I spent the next few days working with HR, filling out forms, um, exchanging information. Everything was on track. But then on a Wednesday, I noticed radio silence. I didn't hear anything. So I reached out to check. The next day I get an email from the hiring manager saying that they had rescinded their offer and they had decided to go in a different direction. This was day 48, six days after I had stopped going to interviews, stopped applying for jobs. My heart sank. My face felt red. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. I did not know this at the time, but as I was, I was having my first panic attack. I couldn't do anything the rest of the day. I didn't leave my house. I didn't talk to anyone. I didn't eat anything. I couldn't even fall asleep. I simply shut down. But next morning I got up and checked if I could attain all the interviews that I had turned down last week. And I reached out to my network and let them know that I was in the market again. I restarted walking my path. I wasn't done yet. Spoiler alert, before my 60 days were up, I got a job doing product design and marketing for a startup in Charlotte. How did I land this? Well, I had met the CEO and founder of this company on LinkedIn a few months ago. His name is John Gorniak, and I'd helped him with a pro bono project that required some tinkering skills. John was growing his company at the time, so he offered to bring me on board to help him grow his business. I had fixed my toy train again. But this time I didn't do it alone. There were so many people who helped me get through it. My former boss at LP Amina, Matt Zedler, who is another Duke alum, by the way, he put me in touch with several hiring managers. Our very own Jenny Johnson, she was with me from day one. Bridget Fletcher, Susan Brown, who were with the MM department at the time, my dad, my friends from the class of 2015, my friends at LPM Mina, my Sifu, who teaches me Kung Fu, and of course, John, who hired me. They all helped me cross the finish line in time. I used to think that I must always fight my battles alone, but that's not true at all. Sure, I may be alone at the start of my journey, but I won't be alone for long. Eventually, I'll have an army of people who will help me get to the other side. All I have to do is keep moving forward. This incident in 2018 wasn't my last challenge with US immigration. I had another challenge last year, but even this time, there were a plethora of people who helped me get through it. Dave Webster, the president at Curatech, the company where I currently work, Scott Rice, my manager, my dad, my partner, my martial arts coach, Ryan Hoover, even he reached out and put me in touch with people who could help. So remember, even when no one answers your call for help, you must still continue walking your path, but know that help will arrive in more ways than you can imagine. A few years ago, I had another broken toy train on my hand, but this time the toy train was me. In the summer of 2020, I had to make several lifestyle changes. You know what I'm talking about. I had to stop going to martial arts, stop going to meetups, stop socializing with people, and basically maintain physical and social distance from everyone in my life. I had battled with depression for quite a while, but this time it felt like depression was winning. I was going to therapy. I was reading books by Maya Angelou and Brené Brown. I was listening to podcasts by Jay Shetty and Tom Bilyeu. All of these solutions seem to be working for everyone else but me. Mm-mm, unacceptable. So then I thought, what if I find someone who is working fine, peek inside their head, compare the two, figure out what I'm missing, and maybe I can make myself okay again. I mean, this strategy worked great the first time, why not again? So the rest of 2020, 
I spend reaching out to entrepreneurs in the mental health space. I'm talking leaders who led support circles, psychologists who created rehab programs for mental well-being, and people who I just thought were wiser than me. By the end of it, I had created a diagnostic tool, a mental process that combines meditation and self-reflection, a tool that helped me get out of my depressive period. But the best gift out of all of this was that I had discovered I had a hidden talent for listening and for navigating mental health challenges. So since then, I have been volunteering with the Mankind Project, sharing my learnings and discoveries with people who need it. This is the time in my life where I discovered the third most important life lesson. Sometimes, it's okay to allow myself to rest. All those days when I was feeling sad that my toy train couldn't be fixed, that day when I had my panic attack and I couldn't breathe, or all those months in 2020 when I felt depressed and I felt disconnected from the world. I thought I was isolating, isolating from everybody, but that's not true. My body was simply resting, giving it time to recharge so I could start back in my path again tomorrow. I'm going to teach you another trick today. Graduates, stay seated this time, but close your eyes and take your right hand and put it over your heart. For the most of us, the heart is on the left side, but if you know you're different, feel free to put it on the right. <laughs> Take a deep breath in through your nose and into your belly. As you inhale, feel your belly rise. And as you exhale, squeeze every last molecule of air out, making space for the next one. Do this for a few breaths. Now think of a memory in your childhood where you felt safe, where you felt loved, where you felt supported. Whatever feelings you felt at the time, allow yourself to feel those now. Let your mind wander through that memory. Now take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Open your eyes and relax your hands. When you walk out of here today, out into the real world, as independent, self-reliant individuals, you're going to face a lot of tough challenges. I know this because you're all 20-somethings graduating with a master's degree from Duke University. To accomplish something like that at such an early age, you have to be the kind of person that loves tackling challenges. Now, I'm not saying people who don't graduate with a master's from Duke are not hardworking. They are. And you're going to meet them out there. And you're going to have to compete with them. And even when life isn't throwing challenges your way, I know you're going to go out of your way to find those challenges and tame them. Because that's the kind of person you are. And that is an inspiring quality to have. Just remember, when you feel stuck, it's okay to take a pause. When you feel tired and lost, do this exercise that we just did. Tap into that memory. Allow yourself to rest. I promise you, you will go much farther if you take the necessary rest every now and then when you need it. I shared a lot of stories with you here today. I don't expect you to remember all of them, but I want you to remember three things. One, start walking your path. Start your journey even if you're alone. Two. Remember that you won't be alone for long, and help will come in more ways than you can imagine. And three, when you need it, allow yourself to rest without judging yourself for being weak or lazy. If you can remember these three things as you build out your unique life, just like I built my unique toy train, mm, that's acceptable. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sheeran. I will now be inviting our graduates to the stage where they will be hooded by a faculty member from their department and congratulated by one of our esteemed faculty members. Family and friends, we will be calling the students up to the, age, up to the stage by their program of study. 
While all graduates are listed in the virtual program in alphabetical order under their department and degree type, this is not the order in which they are seated and will cross the stage. Graduates, we will invite you to come to this stage with your program of study. Please remain seated until your row is directed to rise. As you leave your seat, please make sure to exit your row with your name card and hood draped on your arm. You will return to the same seat after you cross the stage so all other belongings can remain there. Marcy Pacino from our Graduate Communications and Intercultural Programs team will be leading our name of graduates. Now we invite our graduates from the university program in material science and engineering to be hooded. Dong Lin Yang. And now we invite our graduates from cybersecurity to be hooded. Vebhav Zuvari. Cameron Shariar Sotude. <laughs> Shivani Mehta. Wesley Edward Davis. James Thomas Leonard. Jiang Hyun. Archit Kyla. And now we will invite our graduates from artificial intelligence to be hooded. Joao Cardoza. <laughs> Yu Xing Chang. Christian Holler. <laughs> Neha Verde.
Dominique Danielle Natanya Buford. Sri Ramtasia Varisetti. <laughs> Michael Cohen. Leslie Hammer Dees. Shrey Gupta. Ibo Liu. Shen Jun Li <laughs> Elon Wu Nicholas Enrique David Conterno. <laughs> Catherine Ann Greed. And now we will invite our graduates from Medical Technology Design to be hooded. Timothy J. Whitford. <laughs> Jibby Krishna Kaiparambil. Gopalarat Krishna. Varsha Shesadri. Peter Carpenter. Emily Anderson. <laughs> Gabriella Cupshow. Rachel Boylan. <laughs> now we will invite our graduates from biomedical engineering to be hooded. 
Chun Lee. Evan Wendell. Pranav Pandaya. Victoria Winter D'Agostino. Lillian Eckham. Yamil Lopez Ruiz. Rishi Rajendran. Meha Kaushal Desi. <laughs> Lin Shuan Chi. Talia Jeter. Simran Soki. Anusha Krishnamurthy. <laughs> Kamakshi Datatre Bichu. Amisha Ganti <laughs> Garima Ayer <laughs> Joyce. Immaculate Jaya Kumar <laughs> Kiran Shanaz Kaur. Shatorupa Grash <laughs> See you, Joe. <laughs> Jonathan Pangja Lao. Anne 
Andrew Miao. Rutwick Giant Palaska. Swati Ramtalak. Atideep Barudwaj. Shruti Shankar Lincoln. Ritiha Sri Ramalu Jagruti Nyaranapriti Sahu Jishian Carl Yao Shanshan Gao Joshua Chan Carolyn Du Isha Paranzape Abhishek Bhattacharji. Yun J. Lee. Caitlin Stevens. Cadmus Yo. Lokesh Kumar <laughs> Yubin Chen Jiryo Ye Shining Lee Fangrue Leo <laughs> Sh 
Xiao Han Zhou. Pei Ying Liu. Gavin Franson. Christian Chitty. Daniel Lazega. Jerry Holland. Madison Huzar. Matthew Eilander. Jia Ning Chen. Yuan Hao Zhao. Yun Rang Tsai. Yun. <laughs> Yang Lu. Alex Chien. <laughs> Michael Carlton Hamway. Abdurrahman Mansuri. Grace Catherine Lee. And now we will invite our graduates from Risk Engineering to be hooded. Tan Ming Wei. Lee. <laughs> Joanna Novakovska.
And now we will invite our graduates from computational mechanics and scientific computing to be hooded. Cody Lanier. Brian Dung. And now we will invite our graduates from civil and environmental engineering to be hooded. Ellie Kramer. Nathan Borgoni. Kobe Talma. Jin Xiao Tian. Zhang Yu Chen. Sandra Moser. <laughs> Li Su Xiang. Lu Yan Shu Yue Wang. Liao Wen Wei. Joanna Huertas. And now we will invite our graduates from financial technology to be hooded. Ibrahim Khalil Al Suhal. Li Wei Zhao. <laughs> Ching Li.
Ke Chen Yuan. Shu Yang Liu. Shu Wang Ji <laughs> Long Lu. Yi Fan Hu. Jia Ming Guo. Mandy Shui. Julia Catherine Leodori. Roshi Yang. Ruchi Wang. Li Shang Lin. Hao Ran Leo. Ying Ray Zhang. Min Fang. Qian Lu. Pin Zhuo Wang. Ma Ke Xin.
Amy Chong. Wei Jun Yi Han Piao. Chen <laughs> Eping Lu. Sir Chi Yu Zi Chen Zhang. Jie Zhao. Alan Leo. Ying Lei Chang <laughs> Sarangatu Araija. Zi Yan Zhang. <laughs> Long Zhang. Jia Xia Li. Hung Kun Zhao. Jia Cheng Nio Zi Yan Guo.
Feng Rei Huang. Yuan Zhe Wang. <laughs> Zhao Shao Quan. Jia Run Wang. <laughs> Dong Pu. Hao Zhe Mu. Chi Xiao. Han Xia Guo. Wen Yue Bella Zhao. Wen Jie Tsui. Si Han Wang. Pei Lin Luo. Rainy Yan. <laughs> Jing Yu Tan. And now we will invite our graduates from Mechanical Engineering and Materials Science. Victor Xia.
Rucha Pato. Adam Zettel. John Wesley Smalley. <laughs> William Yoon Sing Kim. <laughs> Jake Mann. Eric Zuki. <laughs> Todd Bowman Anderson. Jacqueline Ann Knoll. Pavana Srinivas. Keenan Powers. Jasmine Alexis King. Su Xiang Tsui. Yang Ray. All right, how about one more gigantic round of applause for all of our graduates. Okay. At this time, I'd like to invite our Associate Dean for Master's Programs, Brad Fox, to deliver our closing remarks. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, just a few things I would like to say. Uh, first of all, congratulations for all of your hard work to be a graduate of Duke University. This is an outstanding accomplishment, and you should be proud. Your parents should be proud, and your friends should be proud. Welcome to the Duke family. So as you leave Duke University and start the next phase of your life, I wanted to share with you three perspectives based on my own career. And so the first is have a plan. Know who you are and where you want to go and what you want to do. This is not your friend's plan, it's not your parents' plan, it's your plan on how you, may need, how you want to make a difference in the world. 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Second thought, okay? Uh, this was by Dwight Eisenhower. It may seem counter to the first, but plans are worthless. <laughs> but planning is everything, right? And so the idea there is have a plan, but don't be afraid to change it. Situations change, your perspectives change, and your goals may change. So I want to share with you a little bit of my situation. So after graduate school, I thought my aspirations were to be CTO. I never really wanted to be CEO. If you know me, it's not really my style and not really my strength. But I thought I wanted to be CTO. I worked for IBM, Kobe Steel, and General Electric after completing my degree. And through these experiences, I realized the commitment it took to take on these senior leadership roles. Senior leaders were expected to have a bag packed at all times. They boasted about spending Christmas landing a new deal or addressing some sort of catastrophe within the organization. I recall a comment that Jeff Immelt made after being named CEO of GE and relocating to headquarters. The interview was on him reflecting on his first year as being CEO. And one of the, they were trying to make a personal uh, question. They asked him how he liked his new house in Connecticut. And his response was, I was on the road for 300 days in the last year. This was an eye-opening statement for me, right? For me and my family, this was not a commitment that I wanted to make, and so I changed my goal. Being a CTO was no longer my goal, and so as you go through your career, you're gonna learn more about yourself, more about your skills, more about what you like and what you don't like, and it's very likely your chance your plan is going to plan change. And so what you thought you wanted to do in your 20s may differ from what you want to do in your 30s and may differ from what you want to do in your 40s. That is fine. That is growth. Plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Third thing, and this comes to me from the number of times that I have tried to mentor students who are stressing over career decisions thinking about, what if I make the wrong career decision? From my perspective, there are really two kinds of decisions in life. The first kind have a right and a wrong answer. These can typically be quantified through analysis, and you have clarity on the appropriate choice. Most career decisions are not right or wrong decisions. They tend to be what I view as options decisions. Which role should I take? Do I change companies? Okay, these are not right and wrong answers. I like to think of them more of as cake or pie decisions. I like cake, I like pie. Both outcomes are positive. I'm trying to simply assess which I prefer. So let me talk to you about one of my cake or pie decisions. My first job after earning my material science degree was with IBM. I was developing memory chips. Two years after graduation, IBM announced that they were changing my organization from a development group to a manufacturing group. This caused considerable soul searching for me. My heart was in development. I went to graduate school. I earned a PhD to do development work. Okay, I was faced with a career decision. Should I stay or should I leave? I chose to leave. Now, I followed the semiconductor industry for the next decade. Three out of the four major materials-related developments in semiconductor electronics came out of IBM. In fact, I was working on one of those projects at the time I left IBM. You cannot predict the future. I certainly did not correctly predict the future of development work at IBM. It is fair to say that I was wrong about development work at IBM. But was it a wrong decision? I don't think so, okay? Where I am and where I've been able to, what I've been able to do since leaving IBM have been fantastic. I think we worry too much about these sorts of career decisions. My advice to you is that you assess the information that you have at the time you have to make a decision and go for it with all of your efforts. Even if you don't correct, correctly predict the future, you can be successful on the path you take. It is a cake or pie decision. 
Okay. We are excited that you're graduating and embarking on your career to make a difference in the world. My advice to you is three things. Have a plan, know who you are and where you want to go. Second, be willing to change that plan. Circumstances will change and you should be able to change with it. And finally, don't stress over these career decisions. Make the best decision you can and then put all of your efforts into being successful. So again, I want to offer my congratulations to all of our graduates and look forward to celebrating your successes. I wish you the best and go Duke. Thank you, Dr. Fox. How about a round of applause for our faculty who provided hooding and clothing? And I'd like us to all give a giant round of applause to Bridget Kerwin, who made this all so seamless today. All right. This concludes our ceremony. In a moment, I'll ask our first row of graduates to stand in recess out of the theater row by row. Once our graduates have all exited the theater, we invite our guests to please follow. If your schedule allows, please join us at the Fitzpatrick Center, where we'll have a light reception set up as an opportunity for graduates, guests, and faculty to gather and celebrate together. All right, one more round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. I'd like to ask the first row of students to please rise.